Hello and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MRF HOV SCI Echo. This is our 35th session, and it's a very rainy day today, so everyone is being safe. I um, I don't want to say the hostess for the mostess, but we'll, 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 we'll allow myself that, that, that vanity today, Dr. Gregory Boyce. Glad to have you with us. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Edwards, who is our director and one of our expert panel, Leona Marie Lavia, who is our data manager. Hello. And Ms. Joseph and Conrad, who is our co-host with second mostest. So today we're going to talk about tuberculosis. Second part, the first part was uh, uh, earlier, well, at the end of October, there was a little bit of a hiccup at the last session. So we'll continue this session and we're going to be talking mostly about uh, clinical features, diagnosis and management. So I'm just going to pull that up very quickly and, and as usual, we're going to cross our fingers and hope Technology is kind to us today. Here we go. All right, and does everyone confirm they're seeing this line? Yes, okay, good to go. So, tuberculosis, clinical features, diagnosis and treatment. So this is just acknowledging that our ECHO program is uh, born out of the University of New Mexico ECHO and is supported by uh, the International Training and Education Center for Health or ITEC out of the University of Washington and is PEPFAR funded. And I have no uh, disclosures to, to, to note. So the learning objectives today will be to describe some of the clinical manifestations of tuberculosis in persons with HIV, uh, to describe some of the challenges and tools used uh, to diagnose tuberculosis and to outline the management of TB and HIV. So just to sort of recap the last presentation, so tuberculosis uh, is and remains the leading cause of mortality among persons living with HIV worldwide, and it accounts for one third of the deaths of all persons living with HIV. And in persons living with uh, HIV with latent TB infections, not TB disease, um, there are a 10% annual risk of actually progressing to clinical TB disease versus a 10% lifetime risk in HIV negative persons. And screening for TB can be based on clinical symptoms, so the cough, fever, night sweats, weight loss, that's active TB disease, as well as via uh, PPD testing or uh, interferon gamma release assays, so quantiferon goals and so on. But among persons with HIV, both the PPD testing and the interferon gamma release assays have a higher false negative rate, so it's sometimes uh, not uh, reliable for ruling out the diagnosis. So let's talk about the clinical manifestations of pulmonary disease. And when people say TB, this is kind of what they mean, because it is far and away the most common manifestation of TB disease. Um, the typical quad, uh, sort of four horsemen of, of symptoms would be fever, a non -product, sorry, productive cough, uh, night sweats and weight loss, uh, pleuritic pain, shortness of breath and hemoptysis are, are less common. Um, and systemic symptoms tend to become more common in CD4 count 4, so you know, night sweats and weight loss and so on. Um, there are a small portion of, of, of persons, and I've, I've had personal experience with this, who manifest with very few, if any, symptoms. And their disease will become evident when they begin antiretroviral therapy, and their symptoms then become unmasked because of what we call immunoconstitution syndrome, uh, called unmasking iris. So the typical sort of patient would be someone who comes in, maybe not feeling so well, maybe lost a little bit of weight, no respiratory symptoms, no fever, no night sweats. Start on medication, they come in a couple of weeks later and doctors says it's on this medication, I'm sick, of coughing, I feel, I'm fever, I'm sweating, I'm going to do the x-ray, oh, this is TB. So you didn't get it in the last two weeks, it was only unmasked. And just a quick note about the, the chest examination. So we typically expect with, with chest examination with somebody with a lung infection, you get know, the typical, uh, crepitations and bronchi and this and that. And I speak from personal experience of having taken care of, of TB, HIV, a co-infected person for more than 10 years. Most of the time, the chest is fine. The x-ray looks like the person should be as sick as, as, as anything and you should expect all sorts of sounds. Most of the time, the chest examination is absolutely normal, which is surprising. So in terms of extra pulmonary TB now, so it occurs in anything from about 40 to 80% of uh, HIV positive TB co-infected persons versus uh, about a quarter of that in persons who are HIV negative with extra pulmonary TB. And the, the slide on the side is sort of 
the, the map of how frequently uh, extrapulmonary TB manifests, and you realize there's a wide geographic distribution. So you get a lot of it in, in, in Canada, in North Africa, um, the, the some parts of Asia, Australia, strange enough, but not less so in, in South America and, um, and uh, Russia and China and that sort of thing. Um, but the risk of, of developing extrapulmonary TB increases with advancing immunosuppression. Um, but TB can affect practically every organ. Um, the most common sites that we tend to see are bone marrow TB, um, sorry, um, peripheral TB and vaginitis, miliary TB, and TB meningitis. Less commonly you see it in the abdomen, even though there have been a couple of cases recently. Um, bone marrow TB as part of a disseminated picture and TB pericarditis. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of the commoner ways extrapulmonary TB can manifest. Um, so TB lymphadenitis uh, is uh, one of the most common forms of extrapulmonary TB that we have experienced with, at least at this center, and the cervical lymph nodes, the glands, the neck are the ones that are most commonly affected. The nodes initially are discrete, um, firm and non-tender, but eventually become matted and fluctuant with during sinus formation if it is not appropriately treated. Um, and it's often accompanied by constitutional symptoms. And despite the absence of pulmonary signs, if someone does present with what appears to be um, extra pulmonary TB or TB in their glands, it should prompt a search for pulmonary TB as well, underlying. And it may occur in the context of unmasking a paradoxical iris. So in other words, someone with TB who starts antiretroviral therapy and all of a sudden a gland pops up and starts to separate. And, and that was evidence that they had TB there all along, but that's only now becoming clinically manifest. So another form of extrapulmonary TB, even though you can see it on x-rays, miliary TB. So it's a, it's a progressive disseminated form of TB um, that is as a result of hematogenous dissemination, uh, either during the primary phase of TB acquisition or later during um, reactivation TB. Um, the clinical manifestation can, depends on which organs are involved. Um, it is present in over one third of persons with extrapulmonary TB. And it can result in pulmonary, for pulmonary disease, sorry, with a, you know, ARDS type of picture with much organ failure and septic shock. And the classic picture and the, the picture for which um, malaria TB gets its name is this fine um, two to three millimeter nodular x-ray are finding it and it's supposed to mimic a millet seed. I've never seen a millet seed, but I understand they are small like that. And that's where miliary TB comes from. And it is seen in 85% of patients with miliary TB. It's a very common finding. So the, one of the other um, relatively common and devastating forms of extrapulmonary TB is CNS tuberculosis. So it's the commonest forms that manifest as would be as meningitis followed by CNS tuberculomas. And despite treatment, the mortality rate is not good. Fully half of persons diagnosed with CNS tuberculosis um, succumb to the disease. I was characterized by a subacute onset of fever, nitrous, and weight loss, worsening headaches, sometimes cranial nerve palsies, personality changes, um, gradual worsening of neck stiffness, even though the neck stiffness is not as usually as severe as with bacterial meningitis. And by the time you start getting so focal neurological deficits, so a paralysis of a limb or um, decreased levels of consciousness, um, the, the mortality rates tend, tend to start to spike. Um, the CSF findings in um, tuberculosis meningitis, typically you see a lot of lymphocytes um, with elevated protein and low CSF glucose, which can sometimes sound like um, fungal meningitis. So that is the primary um, differential diagnosis. But um, in order to make sure you don't miss CNS tuberculosis, there has to be high index of suspicion. So any person with, with HIV who presents with you know, some strange CNS symptoms, I'm not quite sure you must think about the possibility of, of CNS tuberculosis. So in terms of the radiological findings of tuberculosis, so in terms of chest disease, um, it depends on the severity of immunosuppression. So the higher CD4 count goes in someone with tuberculosis, the closer the radiological findings mimic that of someone HIV negative with tuberculosis. 
So the classic um, picture you think about in terms of tuberculosis would be um, you know, the upper lobe capitations and that sort of thing. But the, as the CD4 comes falls, you tend to get less of, 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 of that cavitaris um, type of disease and you tend to get um, less of upper lobe predilection. That's what that, that um, the graph on the right shows. Essentially, with persons with CD4 counts above 200, um, the, this was the, the chances of having cavitaris disease, so it's north of 50%. And in CD4 persons with CD4 counts less than 200, it was less than one in four had ever had a cavitary disease. And this x-ray, these were actually two patients who uh, were fairly recently hospitalized. One on the left is actually someone who is living with HIV, on antiviral medication, well at heard for 10 years, he forgot over 500. And you can see the typical sort of upper lobe by cavity, ca cavitation. You can just about see it in outline here, big cavities, this person had smear positive disease, did extremely well. Um, but interestingly, despite all of that, negative mantle test, right? And this is someone else, again, in, uh, diagnosed with smear, negative tuberculosis, and we'll get to that. But if you can, if you can see, the, 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 the infiltrates are scattered throughout both lungs, top and bottom, not a cavity inside, and both of these are tuberculosis. But in the second case to the right, his CD4 count was double digits, I think like 50 or 55. So very low CD4 count and as a result, you're not getting that typical picture you would see. I know if, if, if you didn't pay close attention, you might think, well, maybe this is PCP or something like that, right? So the meteorological picture as the CD4 count falls tends to be a little less characteristic than, than what you would expect. So in the radiological findings in CNS tuberculosis, you tend to get an enhancing exudate in the basal system, so the base of the brain is the most common finding on CT and MRI. But you could also sometimes get, you know, in terms of if you get complications of, of tuberculosis like hydrocephalus or vasculitis, sometimes even strokes, right? Um, those will manifest on, on the CT scan as well. Tuberculomas, which are solid lesions in the brain, can occur without evidence of meningitis. And the, it can be single or multiple, so sometimes it can mimic toxoplasmosis because you do get that sort of ringy husband but the, the classical sign is uh, area of central calcification surrounded by by an area of ring enhancement but it's called a target sign. Now in terms of the laboratory diagnosis of tuberculosis so in terms of sputum smear, sputum smear say that five times fast, or tissue stain so its sensitivity is not good only about 50 to 60 percent uh, of persons with HIV will have um, positive uh, um, sputum smears, and that, posi that positive tube falls, the more immunocompromised the person gets. Um, smear negative TB is, is common among persons with HIV who also diagnosed with TB, especially those in, in persons with advanced immunodeficiency without cavitary disease. And AFB smears on CSF um, are positive in a broad range, so like 10 to 90 percent, which is a big range, right? But it, it, the sensitivity is improved. Um, with uh, multiple um, extractions of CSF on large volumes. But then again, that has to be balanced by the fact that how well, how well a patient is going to tolerate your coming with, you know, sticking the in their back and pulling out large volumes of fluid. Now, in terms of the, the pathologic findings, so if let's say you think somebody has TB in a lymph node and you do a biopsy, the pathologic findings may change because what you expect is a typical non-caseating granuloma. But if you, if the person is very immunocompromised, the immunological um, response required from granuloma formation doesn't even happen because the immune system is that weak. So you might see um, varying um, inflammatory infiltrates that don't look like a typical non-caseating granuloma. If you can see granulomas at all. So, so the, the experienced histopathologist must be aware of that fact. Um, TB culture remains the gold standard for TB diagnosis, but it can take weeks to months. It has the advantage of allowing for drug sensitivity testing, and the yield of the culture is not affected by HIV or the degree of immunodeficiency. Once the organism is present, it can be cultured. So nucleic am acid amplification techniques or PCR techniques are now in common usage in our region as well as in other low and middle income countries. It is more sensitive than sputum smear, um, 
speech and spin microscopy, but it varies based on the nature of the sample. Um, with uh, high yields from lymph nodes, CSF, gastrocasparis, and lower yields from things like pleural fluid and other cell fluids, for example, if someone had TB peritonitis and you take a sample of fluid, um, the, the yield from the uh, uh, abdomen may not be as high, right? Um, it does allow for rapid identification of rifampicin resistance, which is of increasing um, importance given the global spread of MDR, uh, which is multi drug resistant, and XTL, which is extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. Um, there is a new uh, version of the um, expert um, um, assay called the, um, the um, expert ultra assay. It is approved by the WHO, it is more sensitive but it is not yet FDA approved uh, for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. There is a, a, a urine test called lipoarabinomano LAM. Um, it's essentially like a pregnancy test for tuberculosis, if you can think of it in that way. Um, it, it, it detects a, a part of the tuberculosis cell wall that is excreted in urine, but it, it tends to be more sensitive in persons who have um, extensive disease and in persons with low CD4 count, so CD4 count less than um, to less than 100, but the sensitivity is not great. So if it is in fact positive, it, it, it can um, help make the diagnosis, but as with many other things, a negative test does not exclude disease. So in terms of TB treatment, so regardless if someone is HIV positive or negative, the treatment is more or less the same. This initial um, four drug um, treatment with isoniazid, rifampicin, ethambutol, and pyrazidamide usually for eight weeks. And at the end of that, um, if, if the TB is drug susceptible, um, then the person will go to a, a four, four, four month period uh, with two drugs, isoniazid and one of the rifamycins, right? So typically rifampicin, but as we will, will, will speak about later, depending on um, the antiretroviral the person is on, that can also be substituted with rifabutin. Um, the management of, of MDR and XDR TB is very complicated and I thought it would be beyond the scope of this presentation um, because there are so many new drugs and so many new agents, but it can take as much as a year and a half to up to close to two years to manage um, MDR and XDR TB. Um, a lot of the newer drugs like Bedaquilin and, and some of those other drugs um, are on the WHO list of required medicines. I do not know what sort of availability we have in this country. Um, there are thankfully a uh, few cases of MDR TB in Trinidad and Tobago, and I do not know if there's ever been a single case of XDR TB, which is a great thing because when XDR TB was first identified in South Africa, um, in that first cohort, um, it was about six, six or 16 patients, all of them passed away within six weeks of diagnosis, and, and it is very contagious. So we, we have to give a, a, a great vote of thanks to our, our, our national TB team for making sure to, to, to keep MDR-TB and XDR-TB under control in our country. So when we are thinking about co-treatment of HIV and tuberculosis, it's, it's a complex problem because I remember before uh, we had the availability of some of those co-formulated TB medications, where you had all four drugs in one tablet, and you decided to take four of those tablets and have your, your four, four, four drugs for the, the full eight weeks. Patients were taking isoniazid, perazidin, myethambutol, um, and, uh, separately, and had to take vitamin B6, had to take cotrimoxidol usually, and then not actually for our medication, and then not this and not that. So something taking 60 and 20 tablets a day was tremendous. And patients would complain. It's a lot of pills to take. All of them have GI side effects. Some of them have metabolic side effects. So you do get occasionally persons be developing I mean, life-threatening drug-induced um, liver injury. We had, we had a couple of patients who passed away from it. So there are lots of, 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 of comp complexities and difficulties in the co-treatment of HIV and TB. Um, Iris being one of those as well as we spoke about earlier. But in terms of, but despite these challenges, one of the things that we know about treating both conditions is that it improves survival, especially in persons with the lowest CD4 counts. It increases the risk of additional opportunistic illnesses because the faster you start your patient on the, on the path of immune restoration, um, the faster they are uh, going to, to, the less likely they are to pick up more opportunistic infections or while you treat their tuberculosis. Um, you can achieve high rates of viral suppression, it, it may improve your TB outcomes, 
uh, even though you run the risk of developing IRS, it typically does not cause um, return rates of, signif of, tre of uh, treatment limiting adverse effects. So what do you do in terms of when you start actual viral therapy? So as, we, as has been shown in several studies, if this person's CD4 count is below 50, the, we must start antiviral therapy within two weeks of starting the anti-TB treatment um, because anything beyond that has been shown to be associated with higher rates of mortality. And if um, the CD4 count is above 50, we can wait out that first eight-week intensive uh, phase of TB treatment. And at the end of those eight weeks, you introduce your, um, your anti-TB retroviral medication. Um, adherence of what should be offered, um, especially in persons who have lots of psychosocial social challenges, which tend to be a lot of persons who end up in CORA. Um, in, and when TB occurs in patients who are already on antiviral therapy, for example, that, the x-ray that I showed here, that person was already on ART for several years when he developed tuberculosis. Um, TB, TB treatment should be started immediately. And if there is a need to, to um, modify the antiviral therapy, it should be done as soon as possible after initiation of anti-TB medication. And for persons who have a lot of uh, adherence problems, um, DOTS should be initiated. We have at least one patient right now who is um, actually has, has TB uh, recurrence and is on second line therapy with us who needs a lot of support. And the, the DOTS program has been very helpful in terms of getting her back under control. Uh, there is one caveat when it comes to TB meningitis, as there is no clear uh, evidence based with respect to when treatment should begin. Um, because one of the things we don't want to run into is uh, triggering intracranial iris with tuberculosis meningitis, because that can, at least in the example of cryptococcal meningitis, can be fatal. Um, so there are no clear guidelines with respect to when to start. So some uh, authorities state, well, follow the same protocol as, as, as above. Others um, will recommend more caution um, in terms of how treatment is initiated. So in terms of uh, what we treat um, TB, HIV with, we continue rifampicin. The preferred antiretroviral is the fibrin because it's well tolerated. Um, we can con continue normal dosing, we don't have to increase the dose, um, but other non-nucleosides don't hold up as well. So never epinoetravirine, there has been evidence uh, in, uh, suggesting increased rates of virological failure. Uh, even with never um, there has been a suggestion that in, in persons who uh, need to start treatment who are not candidates for favorins, and where uh, we're not tolerating protease inhibitors, for example, like lupin and veritonavir, which would have to be double dose and very few not available, so it's the only caveat. So if you're forced to use something like nivirapine, that you omit a two-week leave-in dose, because usually with nivirapine, you give 200 milligrams once a day and then 200 milligrams twice a day thereafter. Um, there are some, there is some suggestion that you omit a two-week leave-in dose, However, given that um, there are other alternatives, for example, um, some of the newer integration inhibitors, that may be um, no longer absolutely necessary. So in terms of, um, as I alluded to earlier, what are the alternatives if um, if is are not available? So with Raltegravir, you would have to double the dose. Um, so 800 milligrams twice a day. Uh, with Dolotegravir, again, you double the dose. With Bictegravir, which is co-formulated with tenofovir alafenamide and emerisotibine as Bictavi, um, there is no way to increase the dosing without dumping the two drugs, so it's not um, recommended. And TAF cannot be given with rifampicin at all, so um, Bictavi and um, uh, rifampicin are just not compatible with um, either rifampicin or rifampicin. So in terms of using rifibutin with boosted protease inhibitors, so rifibutin, thankfully, does not affect significantly the drug levels of most um, protease inhibitors. However, the protease inhibitors um, affect the metabolism of rifibutin and one of, a, one of its major metabolites such that you get um, much uh, a great elevation in the drug levels. So in order to mitigate against that, 
the dose has to be reduced. So 150 milligrams in one city as opposed to the usual dose. But there still has to be um, monitoring of, of some of these side effects of fibrosis, like uveitis and hepatitis, neutropenia, and so on. Um, but it is necessary in, uh, in someone who is on a protease inhibitor and rifibutin because the protease inhibitor is raising the dose of rifibutin and we're under dose and we're reducing dose of rifibutin. If the patient is not taking the PIs, then we're under dosing for rifibutin. What can happen is that the person winds up developing rifamycin resistance because they're actually under dosing. So there is a, 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 an absolute imperative for persons on that combination to have robust adherence support and regular monitoring to make sure that to, to ensure that not um, develop, um, pushing the, the, the patient into a MDR situation. Um, so we're going to speak a little bit about immune, uh, immune constitution inflammatory syndrome. So it's a paradoxical worsening of clinical symptoms after starting antiretroviral therapy. You can also begin even just starting anti-TB medication because remember TB in and of itself is immunosuppressive. So if you start anti-TB medication, you can sometimes get paradoxical worsening uh, even before you start your antiretroviral uh, therapy. The exact mechanism is not completely well characterized, but it's thought to be a dysregulation between the rate at which your CD8 suppressor and your CD8 uh, natural killer um, uh, cells are, 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 are reconstituted. So you get more of that um, the natural killer type pro-inflammatory T cell response as opposed to the suppressor type response. So essentially your, your immune system is, is sort of um, all engine no breaks for a little while. Uh, but thankfully, um, in most cases, it's not um, fatal. It can be managed with non steroidals like ibuprofen or, or diclofenac. And in most of their cases, you can use steroids. Um, but that, uh, and, and typically, the, the guidance would be to treat through iris, not to disrupt and not to stop either your TB medication or your antiretrovirals. Um, there was a concern that with, immune, with um, um, integrated inhibitors, because they drop the CD4 counts and raise the, sorry, they drop the viral loads and raise the CD4 counts so rapidly that there would be an increased risk of iris uh, with those agents, but uh, recent studies have shown that not to be the case. Uh, so in summary, uh, the diagnosis of TB among persons with HIV is complicated by atypical clinical, radiological, and laboratory test results, uh, early recognition of disease and prompt initiation of appropriate anti-TB and antiretroviral treatment gives the patient the best chance of a good outcome. And TB iris is usually mild and can be managed with non inflammatories or steroids. So uh, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll open the floor for questions. So I just want to um, welcome everybody who I've seen a couple of new names. So welcome everyone. So if there are no questions, um, Dr. Parvin, can I can you um, invite you to start the case, to start presenting your case? Greg, we have a question there from Dion. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Dion, you're muted, so if you unmute yourself, you can, we can all hear the question. Okay, okay he's typing. So I just want to shout out to Dr. Siro, who is a longtime colleague and dear friend. So welcome, welcome. Maybe while Dion is typing, you can set up your, your screens, etc., Dr. Parbu.
So that question has taken a little while to come in, or oh, here it is now. Not sure if you missed it, but I know that one of the TB treatments, it gives a bad reaction to one of the HIV treatment regimes. How do you deal with that and have it ever occurred locally here in Trinidad? All right. So when you say bad reaction, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume you mean a, a, a drug drug interaction. So that's sort of what I was alluding to. So one of the, uh, the issues with um, one of the drugs that's used standard uh, in TB money, TB treatment, some call it rifampicin, uh, ref, sorry. Um, rifampicin belongs to a class of drugs called enzyme inducers. What it does, it causes certain enzymes in the liver to um, accelerate the metabolism of other drugs. And that has a significant impact on drugs that are metabolized through those pathways. So, and as it happens, quite a few HIV drugs are metabolized by those pathways, right? So drugs uh, like Kalitra, I think we might have lost Greg there for a moment. Dr. Boyce, are you still with us? to overcome that reduction in activity. So for example, like with Atisanavir, it's like an 80% reduction. Um, and so, but with Lopinavir, Tonavir, which is Kalitra, you can double the dose. So, and, and you're able to get adequate um, drug levels at that higher dose. The difficulty arises that, I mean, that means you're asking someone to take four Kalitra tablets twice a day. Kalitra is sometimes not well tolerated to begin with. Uh, lots of GI side effects. So if you're asking someone to take twice that dose, the side effects sometimes are, are really unpleasant. And um, the other issues is, is, is that you can sometimes, um, uh, I, I just love my train for this something. So under these side effects, you can sometimes get a, a liver injury because you're on so much medication. So what you typically you try to do is switch from rifamycin to rifamycin, to, to rifamycin, sorry, and that allows you to use um, most drugs at a, at, a, at, a, at a usual dose instead. In terms of a skin reaction, so any drug that you take, you might be allergic to. That can happen with um, TB drugs as well. Um, it's it's not that common, at least in, in, in my experience, because I, I, I would have seen quite a few patients who would, who would have been at um, Cora on all those medications. The incidence of rash is, is not that high, thankfully. And most times when it occurs, um, it, it, it was actually due to the efavirenz or to cotrimoxazole, which is one of the other drugs that they were on, right? But you can get very serious skin manifestation with any of the and the TB drugs, but most commonly would be our, uh, again, um, rifampicin and isoniazid. Okay, I hope that answers the question. 